And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker. So God made a farmer. Howdy folks, Darren back with you here at Cross Timbers Farm. Welcome to 8th Day Chronicles on this absolutely gorgeous July evening here on the farm. We've had temperatures in the 90s uh, for about the last week, week and a half. And uh, man, I'm telling you, it has been hot here in the mountains of North Carolina. Uh, best time to be out on your farm doing things is the mornings and then again late evenings and it's evening time uh we got a hour or two before darkness falls but uh this is a great time to be out on the farm uh, checking our test plot checking our hay feeding our chickens and things of that nature makes you glad to be alive god's good and all the time uh, this time of year is, is a nice time of the year and the time of day, the evening to be out on the farm. We're, we're blessed. Uh, before we go any further, I would really like to ask our viewers, if you will, to please subscribe to our channel. That really encourages us to bring this camera equipment out to the farm and share what we know, uh, our knowledge on some things and to share what we do day to day on the farm and to talk about hay with you and small scale hayers and uh, small family farms. We really appreciate it. You stopping by our channel and visiting with us. And if you're so inclined, please hit that subscribe button and um, hit the notification bell. Give us a thumbs up, drop some comments. Uh, we would really, really appreciate that drop some comments and we will interact with you uh, on our channel. Unlike maybe some larger channels that have, uh, that rarely interact with anyone, we will interact with you and we appreciate that. We like to get to know our audience and our subscribers and become friends. Well, today we are starting a small series of videos on quality hay, on small scale quality hay. If you own a huge hay operation in Manitoba or Saskatchewan or Michigan or um, all the way down through the country into the south, uh, our channel is more about small scale and small family farms, uh, hay production on small acreage, which could be you know anywhere from a half acre to who knows how much. It could go on up to a hundred acres, but the equipment that we use and our techniques are tailored towards small scale hay operations and we enjoy that so um, if you're a small scale hayer we, i think you're going to gain a lot of information from these videos after each video i'd like for people to comment uh, drop some comments along the way of your tips things you do things you see in your area uh, we got to realize that every area of the country is a little bit different. Soil conditions and um, weather, different elevation uh, that affect growing seasons and all, all that comes into play. Um, so there's no magical one size fits all. So bear that in mind, we are in Western North Carolina we're in the mountains of Western North Carolina. 
and our elevation is a lot higher than the Piedmont or uh, the, the coastal areas of North Carolina. We are, uh, for folks that's not familiar, Western North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains has the highest mountain peak east of the Mississippi River, Mount Mitchell, which is in Yancey County, North Carolina, and stands 6,687 feet in elevation. So the, the whole western end of North Carolina is mountainous in the Appalachian Mountains and our elevation's higher. Our growing season is as long. Most folks in our area get two cuts of hay a year, but we can go down the mountain to some friends that we know that cut hay, and they're a lot lower elevation. They can get upwards three and upwards of four cuts per year off their hay. We normally get two, most folks in this area. And you'll have to pardon uh, this video this evening, the gnats, the little bitty black gnats, they are relentless this year. I've never saw them so bad. I don't know if it's from uh, the wet spring we had, but there's just clouds of them everywhere you go. And you can take off walking and look behind someone, and there'll be a cloud of black gnats just flying behind them, <laughs> following them along. They're terrible. So pardon my wiping and sweating. It's trying to keep the gnats off of me. What I need is a Swisher Sweet Cigar or some cigar smoke. I don't advocate tobacco use, but uh, if you smoke tobacco, that's that's your business. But uh, the cigar smoke will really keep the gnats at bay. I don't have any with me, but wished I did. Um, as I said, we're going to start a uh, video series on quality hay for the small scale hay operation. I see in my area way too much. I drive by, you know, you can see some hay fields from a road or something like that. And I've seen people baling hay, if you want to call it hay. I've seen people baling forage, if you want to even call it forage that literally I would have took a rotary cutter, a bush hog, and hooked to my tractor and just went through and, and mowed that down. They were baling weeds. They were not baling hay. They were baling about 20% hay and about 80% weeds. Um, years ago, before we started making and baling and processing our own hay, we used to buy hay. And several years ago, we bought some hay that was supposed to be quality hay. Uh, one of the few first bales of that hay, Susan opened a bale of hay, and I think everybody has saw where the utility companies on the side of the highways will put out these little narrow strips of metal that a sign that says caution, underground buried cable, do not dig, things like that. She opened up a bale of hay, of this so-called quality hay, and out fell one of those utility signs, all mangled up and everything. You could tell it had been hit by the, the, the mower and hit by the baler and just mangled up. Fell out of that bale of hay. That bale of hay was about 40% hay, 60% trash. I mean, absolute trash. That bale of hay was so full of the autumn before's oak leaves. I guess they'd bailed it along the edge of the field and hadn't cleaned the leaves out of that field. It was 60% leaves. And what little, well, I don't even know if there's 40% hay in it. I guess maybe 10%. Uh, the rest of it was goldenrod and uh, horse nettle and some kind of viney material. It had dried up so bad I couldn't exactly tell what it was. My daughter had a couple core horses. 
they would not even look at that hay. They'd walk over to the hay rack and, and sniff around on that hay and maybe bite into a piece or two of it and drop it and walk back away. They wouldn't even eat it. It was horrible and we paid a premium price for it. Um, if you sell hay, that bale of hay is your reputation. You will be known real quick whether you, you produce quality hay or you produce junk hay. Way too many people produce junk hay. And I'm almost convinced a lot of those folks know better, but a lot of them, I should say not, a few of those folks know better. A whole lot of those folks have no idea. To them, hay is hay. They've ne if it's baled up, it's got to be hay. They've never educated their self on what's quality hay, what makes quality hay. What's the nutrient value of this hay I'm, I'm getting ready to bale? What, it, what is orchard grass? I've actually saw some folks baling hay that couldn't tell the difference between orchard grass and timothy and tall fescue. They had no idea what a legume was. You could say, oh, that's got red clover in it. Yeah, they knew what that was, but you could ask if you're your hay had any legumes in it and they didn't know what you're talking about. In today's world with information on the World Wide Web and books and quality books and quality information, there's no excuse not to be educated to a certain degree on a product that you're selling. Really no excuse in it. You can see I'm holding here a a little past prime. It's already had seed headed, but look at the leaves on this orchard grass. This this hay's past prime, and we're going to dive into a lot of that type of stuff in the next couple of videos about when to cut your hay, um, what time of day to cut your hay. Uh, a lot of stuff goes into this that that a lot of folks don't realize. Our videos on small scale hay equipment, like our Farmax Kowalski drum mower and our little Farmax FMRB 330 mini round baler. Uh, small scale hay and equipment is really growing in popularity. There's just too much interest in it for there not to be, just from the questions we get on our equipment. Okay, if, if those little balers and drum mowers and hay rakes and things for small scale hay is growing in that much popularity, that means somebody's gotta be cutting hay, baling hay, or else they would not be interested in that equipment. Is, is your investment in that equipment worthwhile? Are you, did you, did you invest in that equipment to bail trash? Did you invest in that equipment to feed your own animals? You've heard the old saying, you'll get out of something what you put into it. You feed your animals trash hay and your animals are gonna look like trash. That, that's a metaphor, you know what I'm saying. If you have dairy animals, you feed your dairy animals junk hay your milk's gonna taste like junk. Um, it's important that you're baling good hay. You're baling quality hay. If you're gonna go ahead and have take the time and the effort and buy the equipment and invest your funds into small scale hay and equipment, what you're using that equipment for and investing your time, you need to make sure you're baling good hay. The best hay you can grow. Without that good hay in your hay field, you might as well take that equipment and just go ahead and sell it. That's, that's how I feel about it. 
uh, you, you're really just kind of wasting your time. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it right. And that's going to start with your dirt. It's not going to start with what kind of hydraulic fluid do I put in my baler. It's going to start with your dirt. What are you baling? But like I said, we're going to do a series on these videos and we will try to come out with a new video and the, the next one in the series about once a week. And we would really appreciate it if you subscribe, hit that notification bell. It'll let you know when the next one's out. We'd appreciate it if you'd share it with your friends that also uh, do small scale hay. And uh, we hope that this will give everybody a boost in their hay production program. For our first video in this series, we're going to, I think everyone that's tuned in thus far, if you've watched any of our previous videos, you understand the concept of small scale hay operations versus large scale. This is definitely geared toward the small scale hay farmer. Okay, if you have made that decision, you're going to start producing hay, small scale, whether it be for your own personal use on your farm, and your farm deserves the very best hay that you can feed your livestock. You deserve that. Settle for nothing less or you, you, you're gonna be producing hay for a, uh, a crop for sale. That's what, you, just like a small soybean farmer, a small corn farmer, you're producing, growing and producing high quality hay for sale. There, at least in this area, your area, your mileage may vary high quality hay in my area is very difficult to find. When you do find it, um, if you don't make your own hay and you have horses or, or goats or whatever sheep, and my opinion is there's no such thing as horse quality hay. It's either quality hay or it's junk hay. One of the two, there's no, no in between. Um, if you're selling hay, or let's just say before you go to get into cutting your own hay and you find someone that has quality hay and you buy hay from them and you love that hay, your animals love that hay, and that hay farmer treats you like family and treats you really well and sells you a high quality product, I would just about bet you got his phone number plugged into your cell phone and you're a regular customer. You want on his list for hay every year. You don't want to have to, you don't want to lose that hay farmer. You don't want to lose doing business with him because you're getting a high quality product from him at a at a reasonable price for him to make a living and for you to be happy. And that's a rare commodity, at least in this area finding high quality hay and being able to get it year after year. Okay, if you're that hay farmer, if you're just starting out or you've been doing this for a while, there's some tips that we can give you to get you started down that road of high quality hay production. The number one tip I can give you start you a test plot. What do I mean by a test plot? Our test plot's right here behind me. We, when we decided to start making hay, our own hay, and we didn't want to bale mediocre hay, junk hay, we wanted the best hay that this area has to offer. All that equipment we bought, we wanted that equipment to be viable and be worth what we paid for it, 
by the product, the end product that we made out of it. You can have the best baler in the world. If your hay's junk, you still got junk hay in the end. Um, we wanted the best hay we could produce in this area. We wanted to be the king of the hill. We started a test plot, and I did not come up with this idea of a test plot. I saw this on YouTube. I do believe it was from the University of Kentucky Extension. I could be wrong. I've not went back and looked at that video again. I think that's where it was. They interviewed a farmer somewhere and he had started him a little small, like half acre test plot of hay where he could work the, the ground and work on the soil, do different techniques of seeding, fertilizing, whatever. Then when he saw the results, he applied to the rest of his hay fields. That's exactly what we've done. We come to our farm here, right next to our barn, with our barns right behind me, or right behind the camera. We designated two tenths of an acre. That's all it is, two tenths of an acre. We designated this little patch of, of, of ground for our test plot. The first thing you need to do when you decide to do this, put your test plot somewhere where it is convenient, it has easy access, that you are in that vicinity almost daily, whether when you come out after work to check on your animals, to feed, whatever you're doing, you can walk by that test plot and see it. Uh, if you have your test plot way on the far end of your farm, somewhere out of sight, out of mind, you won't check it very often. Put this where you can check it daily. It's convenient, you can walk out and check it really easy. Um, keep your test plot small or medium at, at the most. It will save you money, your farm funds. That way you don't have to spend a whole lot of money doing these different amendments to your test plot, working your test plot to see if it works or not. Uh, you need to, for one of the first things you need to do is evaluate your, your test plot. What's already there? Is it absolutely full of weeds? Is it already got really good hay in it? What kind of hay's in it? What kind of hay do you want to uh, grow, you need to evaluate your test plot. Go through it with a fine tooth comb. Um, another reason for your test plot is uh, you need to have soil samples done. You need to, almost every county extension office in about every state, almost every state has ex agriculture extension offices uh, through the, one of the state universities. And they have them in a lot of counties. You need to go by your local agriculture extension office. Most of them will offer soil sample kits for free. Go by, pick you up a soil sample kit, follow the instructions, take you some soil samples in random places in your test plot, send those off and get your results back to see what's going on with your soil, what it's gonna need. Uh, bear in mind your, your, your test plot, well, with, with your hay in general, um, your area, your location, where you're at in, this, in, the, in the country, it's gonna have a whole lot to do with your hay production. Um, has your test plot been grazed in the past? Uh, do you Have you been bush hogging it? Uh, does it have a lot of organic material down in it uh, from that bush hogging? Have, have you had animals on it through the winter and hoof traffic on it? 
with manure and urine and things for to, to fertilize that ground what's it been used for in the past you need to evaluate that that'll have some bearing on uh, how you start out um, one of the main reasons for a test plot one of them is cost on a small family farm you have to always be conscious of your farm budget when you do a small test plot like this you can spend minimal amount of your farm funds on seeding and if you can afford it no-till drill um, on fertilize on soil samples being tested things of that nature and if something does not produce very much results, then you can look back and go, wow, that really didn't produce a whole lot on the test plot. That was, we paid for this material and we applied it to the soil and the results from doing that, was not real good. That tells you that has saved you a lot of money it kept you from doing that on larger acres of your hay field and it not producing really any results much to speak of. The test plot is invaluable for that. Another key benefit of a test plot, if you work a job off the farm, which most, most small family farms those farmers do a small test plot like this is small enough that when you come home from work and it's convenient in its location where you can keep a check on it easily it's easy to see those results it doesn't it doesn't add a workload to your day when you're already tired you can come home and uh, the evening when you're on your way to your farm out to the farm to collect eggs or feed your cows or feed your horses whatever the case may be that test plot is in a convenient spot that you walk right by anyway and you can keep tabs on what's going on what you've done in that test plot the work you've done you can daily check those results so you know the time and the work and if you work a job off the farm which most small family farmers do uh, it's very convenient and most small family farmers don't have an unlimited cash flow just to start throwing at their hay fields a test plot is worth its weight in gold. As soon as you decide we're going to start a test plot, stop by the office store, department store, whatever, pick you up a notebook, start keeping you, and I do it the old fashioned way. I'd rather write it down, I'd rather handwrite it myself is to type it out. Start you a very detailed journal of everything you do to this test plot the date what the weather's like and things such as the date you started your test plot uh, evaluated test plot we heavy weed load uh, mode bush hog test plot for weed control then you can come down, you know, a few dates later and put sprayed test plot in 2-4-D on this date, this date, this time. Um, clipped test plot. Um, received soil samples back. Um, started the amendments to the soil, what you did. You need those notes to be able to refer back to because what you're learning here, this is your classroom. What you're learning here, you're going to apply them to your larger acres of hay. 
And if you don't, if you're like me, <laughs> and you don't have detailed notes, you're gonna forget. Keep notes on what's going on and what you're doing in your test plot. When your farm has decided, yes, we're gonna start us a test plot, you need to come up with some goals. What is the, what is our goal with this test plot? What is our goal with hay? What, what's gonna put us to where we wanna be in hay? Do we wanna have the highest quality hay we can have to sell? Do we wanna have the highest quality hay we can make for our horses? Do we wanna have the highest quality hay we can have for whatever the case may be? You need to have some goals in mind. You need to have some goals in mind too that you want to shoot for. We want to have our test plot producing award-winning high quality hay in three years or four years. Folks, this is not an overnight endeavor. It's going to take some time and some labor. But you're doing it in a small test plot. You're not doing it in 15 acres. This is doable. You're eventually gonna have to do it in your bigger hay fields, but you're going to school yourself and you're gonna be learning every time you're in this hay plot, test plot. Whether you're just evaluating how your hay's growing, you're raking it around and looking, you're looking for the microbiome in your soil, you're looking for life in your soil, you're looking for um, legumes, and cool grasses, season grasses, warm season grasses, whatever your goal is, you're gonna be learning daily. That's gonna benefit your main hay fields tremendously. Topic of hay, when you start, you, you've decided to start you a test plot. You need to start arming yourself with knowledge. It's ridiculous to go out in the hay field and just dig around and don't even know what you're looking at. And if you don't know, you don't know. You gotta start somewhere. We all had to start somewhere. If you have a mentor, a family member that's cut hay uh, for years and years and they're very knowledgeable, good for you. If you don't and you're gonna have to learn on your own, that's still no excuse, you can do that. In the day and age we live in of information that's out there and readily available, you have no excuse. I would highly recommend that you purchase this book. This one is called Southern, Southern Forages, uh, Modern Concepts for Forage Crop Management. This book is a absolute fantastic resource high quality book it is in full color it will actually go through and tell you what glass grass is what uh here's a page on crimson clover pictures pictures of the seeds pictures of the forage in the field um, very detailed descriptions of all the major hay grasses and types of forage. Study this. If you're a hay producer, you, you've heard the old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. As a quality hay producer, you have a arch enemy. Weeds. Weeds is your arch enemy. This book right here, Weeds of the South, this is an absolute fantastic resource. This book was published uh, by the University of Georgia Press. This book is absolutely fantastic. It is full color. It lists 
basically every weed uh, that you're going to find in your hay field. It is a fantastic resource. And study this book. Weeds are your number one enemy when it comes to quality hay production. On the next video, we will dive into the types of hay for quality hay production and timing. Timing of when to frost seed, when to no-till drill, when to cut your hay. That is a number one issue in this area. When to cut your hay for quality hay production. So, thanks for being with us. Please subscribe. Click that notification bell. Give us a thumbs up. Drop some comments. If you already have a test plot started on your farm, let us know. We would love to share information with folks that are doing this also. Uh, I'd like to, to know what kind of results you're getting. Um, we would really appreciate the comments and the thumbs up and stick with us for part two. We're gonna dive deeper into some wins. Thanks for being with us. God bless. Hope you and your family have a blessed evening.